Hi, I'm Paul, KB5MU, with Open Research Institute, and I'd like to share with you my experience tracking down an entertaining bug on the Opulent Voice project. That's the native digital uplink mode for Phase 4 ground and space, including the Hyferia satellite project. It's designed around using the Opus vocoder to send very high-quality digital voice at 16,000 bits per second. The voice data is divided up into 40 millisecond frames, 2,152 bits, including some overhead, and each frame is encoded with a convolutional error correction code. Certain aspects of the opulent voice design were adopted from M17, which is a lower rate digital voice mode intended for VHF and UHF amateur radio use. This is possible because, like everything we do at ORI, M17's design and implementation are open source. The M17 project published a prototype C++ implementation of their modulator, or transmitter, and their demodulator, or receiver, written by Rob Riggs of MobileLink. To get going quickly on opulent voice implementation, we started with that code base. Since then, we've made many changes to the design to support the higher-rate voice codec and our own ideas about the feature set. We've demonstrated early prototypes already, but we're still working on turning the code base into a complete implementation of Opulent Voice. Along with the code that actually implements M17, Rob provided a number of unit tests that can be run automatically. Each unit test exercises a particular aspect of the implementation and checks the results. With finished code, all the tests should pass. It's considered good practice to rerun all the unit tests frequently during development. If a test starts failing, that points to some recent change that had unintended consequences and needs attention. So, the other day, while I was working on something else in the code, I happened to run the tests, and there was a new failure in the interleaver test. We had not touched the interleaver code in a few weeks since Michelle Thompson and I finished redesigning the interleaver for the updated larger frame sizes of opulent voice using RTP protocol layers. It passed the tests then, but now it was failing. As far as I knew, I had not changed anything that could break that part of the code. So, I began to investigate. Before I get into that, let me explain what an interleaver does. Remember I mentioned 40 millisecond frames and a convolutional error correction code. That type of error correction code is very effective at correcting isolated single bit errors, as long as there aren't too many of them on average. It's not so great at correcting contiguous bursts of errors. Unfortunately, in the real world of radio, errors tend to come in bursts. In order to make the most of forward error correction, system designers need to scramble up the order in which the bits are transmitted so that the contiguous bits damaged by a noise burst are spaced out and separated before they go into the convolutional decoder, like this. The original stream of bits is shown on top, and the interleaver is the function that scrambles them up, the crisscrossing arrows, into a new order shown on the second row. The bits are transmitted in the new order and arrive at the receiver on the third row, possibly with a burst error as shown here. Within the receiver, the deinterleaver unscrambles the bits, as shown by the lower set of crisscrossing arrows spreading out the errors so that the FEC decoder has a better chance of correcting them. The interleaver shown here happens to be of the symmetric type. The two tangles of crisscrossing arrows look identical. Interleaving and deinterleaving are the same operation. This is because all of the non-vertical arrows come in pairs, each pair swapping a pair of bits in the transmission. Swapping them back is exactly the same. M17's interleaver is like that. It's a handy property, but not a necessary one. Here, the interleaver on top is symmetric, 
but the one on the bottom is not. However, there is still a systematic relationship between the arrows on top and the arrows on the bottom. Each arrow on the bottom is just the reverse of an arrow on the top. Simple enough, and just as good for our purposes. The opulent voice interleaver is like that. So, how do you decide on a set of arrows? You want to spread out the burst errors as much as possible, but you also want the implementation to be simple. One really simple way to do it is called a row-column interleaver. You have a rectangular array of storage locations. You put bits in by rows and read them out by columns. Any burst error shorter than the row length is guaranteed to be spread out with spacing equal to the column height, and that's pretty good. This works well if the block size is a perfect square, or can be factored into two numbers of similar size. For block sizes that are prime, or have one large prime factor, things get a little messy. Besides that, the spacing achieved by the row-column interleaver isn't the best possible spacing. With some math, we can do a little bit better. All we need is a permutation. That is, for every bit position i in the original block, we need to be able to compute its new position f of i within the interleaved block. Every f of i has to be in the same range as i, namely from 0 to the block size minus 1. And every possible f of i must be used exactly once. In the code, this could be just a lookup table, a list of all the possible values of f of i. This table would have as many entries as our interleaver block has bits. That's not a tiny table, but it's not too big. We would still need to figure out what to put in the table. It can't just be random if we want to get the optimum spacing for burst errors. A good way to generate a suitable permutation is by using a permutation polynomial. A quadratic polynomial is enough. This is just an expression of the form ax squared plus bx plus c modulo the block size. And c might as well be zero because it just rotates the whole interleaved block. The trick is in finding values of a and b that yield a permutation of the right length. There are tools for this in the program MATLAB. Michelle used those tools and some brute force searching techniques to come up with a permutation polynomial for opulent voice. f of x equals 1076 times x squared plus 59 times x, modulo the block size. This makes a permutation of length 2,152, our frame size, and creates spacing that is very nearly the theoretical maximum. In the code, we don't actually bother with a lookup table. We just use the expression directly to compute the indices as we need them. At some point, we should probably measure how much CPU time this is costing us. Maybe switching to a lookup table would be a worthwhile optimization. So, what went wrong to make the unit test start failing. The test that failed is very simple. Let's take a look at it. The first line creates a frame-sized buffer of bytes named DC in the lowercase. The second line fills up that buffer by copying the bytes from uppercase DC. These bytes were chosen at random, but they weren't chosen just for the unit test. Instead of creating its own test data, the unit test reuses some random bytes that already exist in the code. These are the bytes used to randomize or whiten the transmitted data. As far as I know, it was just a convenient shortcut to use those bytes. The bits in both buffers are packed into bytes, which is what this version of the interleaver expects. The next three lines of code declare an interleaver object and call it once to interleave the buffer in place, and again to deinterleave it again in place. If everything is working right, the buffer should end up with exactly the original data, unchanged. The remaining lines check to see if that happened. This is the simplest possible test for an interleaver. The expect EQ macro you see inside the loop 
is part of the Google Test Suite, a popular library used to facilitate and automate unit testing. If the two arguments to expect EQ are not equal, it outputs a message and marks that test as failed, but it doesn't stop the test. So we get a complete list of bytes that don't match after the test. The output shows the value found and the value expected. But unfortunately, it doesn't show the index i, so we have to do some extra work to figure out exactly where the test failed. I just ran the test in the debugger and dumped out the contents of both buffers to the console. After some cleanup in a text editor, I compared them with a program called Kaleidoscope, and it looked like this. Huh. The first screen full of bytes were all correct. Scrolling down, it turns out most of the bytes were correct. There was just one run of 19 consecutive bytes that were wrong. Seen here. From index 51 to index 69, every single byte was wrong. The other 250 bytes in the buffer were correct. That makes no sense. How in the world could an interleaver fail that way? Well, you know, the interleaver is not really working with bytes. It's working with the individual bits. They just happen to be packed up into bytes. Maybe the pattern will make more sense if we look at bit errors instead of bytes. I was hoping Kaleidoscope would color the erroneous bits for me, but apparently it's too smart for that. So I used some more text editor magic and converted that display into this one. Each X represents a bit error, and each dot represents a correct bit. It looks awfully random. There are 80 errors and 73 correct bits, which is pretty close to 50%, and there's no obvious pattern. I showed the results to Michelle, and she agreed that they looked random and made no sense, unless maybe the interleaver or deinterleaver was using a lookup table that had somehow become corrupted. It, it isn't. It uses the permutation polynomial directly. Here's the code. It's dead simple. So it's time for some more detailed code inspection. What could possibly go wrong? Here's the entire interleave function. Again, it starts by declaring a buffer the size of a frame of packed bytes. It prefills that buffer with zeros, although this is not really necessary. Then for every bit index i, it moves the bit at that index in the input to the corresponding place in the output. To do that, it calls three helper functions. After the loop ends, it copies the local temporary buffer over the input data. The local buffer goes out of scope when the function ends. Of the three helper functions, two of them, assign bit index and get bit index, just translate between bit indexes and bits packed into bytes. These functions are a little bit complicated, but they are exercised separately by a different unit test function, which has been passing reliably all along. Here's a bit of a spoiler. These functions and their helper functions all work fine, as far as I know. The other helper function, index, we've already seen. It just implements the polynomial, one line of code. So let's look at the deinterleave function. Does it look familiar? That's because it's almost identical to the interleave function. The only difference is that the copy is in the opposite direction, reversing the arrows just as in the picture. I love that symmetry. I'll give you a few more seconds to appreciate it. These functions are all too simple and too systematic to cause the weird behavior we're seeing. Aren't they? Let's review the test results. We see 51 bytes correct, then 19 bytes wrong, then 199 bytes correct. Without knowing exactly where the wrong data is coming from, it's impossible to be completely precise about these counts, because some of the bits might be right just by accident. But it's highly unlikely that accidents change the picture very much. If we convert these counts to bits, we get 408 bits right, 
then 152 bits wrong, then 1592 bits right, plus or minus a few in each case. These numbers still don't make any sense to me. We've not found the clue we need to solve this mystery. The test results are completely repeatable. So it doesn't seem as if there's any kind of timing problem or memory corruption or anything that weird. In fact, everything here is completely simple and straightforward, except for the math that gave us the permutation polynomial. A quick check of the polynomial with Excel, and again with Python, showed that the expression does indeed yield a permutation over the range 0 to 2151. That is, each input from 0 to 2151 yields a different output, and every output is also in that range. So if the math is right, the computation must be going wrong somewhere. Let's look at that index function one more time. That one line of code is also pretty straightforward. Looks very much like the code that just worked in Excel and in Python. For input i, we multiply i by f1, which is 59. Then we multiply i by itself to get i squared, and then by f2, which is 1,076. Add the two terms up and take the result modulo the block size, which is 2,152. That all sounds exactly right. The only other code to look at is the function prototype at the top. It declares both the input index i and the return value to be of type size t, which is defined in C++ to be an integer data type big enough to hold any memory address. So it's guaranteed to be big enough to index any array. That's a big integer type, so it should be perfectly fine. Except we aren't just using it to index an array. We're computing with it. And that quadratic term starts to look a little iffy now. 1076 times i squared, and i can be as big as 2151. Let's just compute that value before the modulo operation. Well, isn't that a suspicious number? Pretty close to a very familiar number from computer science. 2 to the power 32. Well, damn. This computation is too big to do in 32 bits. Exactly where does it break down? We can estimate that by undoing the expression. Divide 2 to the 32 by 1076 and take the square root. We can ignore the other term. It's much smaller. We get 1997 point something. So it looks like i values up to 1997 are probably fine. But i from 1998 all the way to 2151 will fail by integer overflow. That's 154 of the bit indexes computed wrong, which is a match for the approximately 152 errors we got from the count of error bytes. This completely explains the problem. And if we just force the arithmetic to be done in 64 bits, as shown here, recompile the code, and rerun the test, it passes. Now wait just a second. How did this ever work? I didn't tell you this because I didn't know it was relevant until I'd reached this point in the debug process. But I don't always test on the same computer. That day I was testing on a Raspberry Pi because that's about the right class of machine for our Phase 4 ground station. That's 64-bit hardware, but under the default Raspberry Pi OS, user programs run in 32-bit mode for compatibility. So size t is a 32-bit unsigned integer, and the calculation fails. On other occasions, I've developed on a virtual machine, on the ORI Remote Lab's Unraid server, running Ubuntu Linux in 64-bit mode. On that VM, size t is a 64-bit unsigned integer, and the calculation works just fine. And I was using the VM when we redesigned the interleaver. It was easy to forget the difference between the Raspberry Pi and the VM 
because I operate them both remotely using Visual Studio Code on my desktop Macintosh. Visual Studio Code does an amazingly good job with remote development and even remote debugging. A more modern programming language would have caught this problem for me. Either it would have integers of unlimited size, like Python does, or it would have caught the overflowing multiplication as an error at runtime if it couldn't figure it out at compile time. C++ does none of those things in the name of runtime efficiency. Just another reason why I'm not a big fan of C++. This experience has reinforced my enthusiasm for unit testing, though. I'm not always careful about providing formal unit tests for my own code. But if the original author had not provided interleaver tests that were so easy to rerun, I might not have found this problem until much later. And it would have taken much longer to figure out that the interleaver was the source of the problem and why. Thanks, Rob, for the unit tests. And thank you for listening. I hope you learned something, or at least found it entertaining to watch me struggle with this bug. We do all this work out in the open, sharing our results as we go along under open source licenses. To learn more, visit openresearch.institute on the web. And check out Open Research Institute on GitHub for code, documents, and more.